standard Ottoman hook blade. That's too hard. What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook. And I'm the Blade. Together we're, you know. Welcome to The Hook Blade has two parts, the hook and the blade, so you can use one or the other in elegant design. <laughs> I'm your host, Lawson, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Tim. Uh, Tim, what's the most shocking revelation you've ever heard in your life? Um, oh, well, recently I found out that uh, honeybees are male and worker bees are, are female, you know? that is That is kind of... You wouldn't expect it. Doesn't it flies in the face of social gender norms? It really does. Like bees are. I think we. I think you can make an argument that bees are the most progressive of us. And you know what? It makes sense because they're also dying at an alarming rate. <laughs> Just like you know, we don't have to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, I'm I'm so I'm psyched that you brought up insects because I actually had a really like traumatizing experience this morning. I went to I went to go take a shower. I don't know if you saw this. I was posting about it on our on our little merry band of Discord buddies. Um, but I discovered and then shortly after murdered a spricket. Are you familiar with sprickets, Timothy? A spricket. I have no idea what the fuck that is. Are you ready, dude? It's a portmanteau of spider and cricket that sounds terrifying you know what its defining trait is <laughs> is that what? as it is that it, it's basically blind so as a defense mechanism if it hears something approaching it it will jump onto them holy fuck to scare them away no <laughs> that sounds terrible <laughs> now i was really lucky because the spricket that i discovered actually had stepped in some adhesive on like a, a, like on a sort of wall hanging art that was in the bathroom where I was trying to take a shower. So it was struggling to get free from the adhesive. Not that I even knew. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was famous for, but that is, that is harrowing. Yeah, man. Insects are, are just a whole other fucking world. <laughs> I really, I really hate them, dude. I'm like, I'm one of those guys that just like, I'm not fucking with any form of, bug or insect arachnid just miss me with all of that well if you could if you could plop in like a praying mantis in your house he'd probably take care of all of that shit you know i thought that way before because i had like an ant problem and then i saw a spider in my room and i was like well i've heard that spiders kill ants so i should just sort of let this whole thing sort itself out and then like <laughs> days later i found 12 spiders in my room because the first one went and told all of its friends that I was cool. <laughs> and also, there's stuff to eat there. And and there was a massacre that day. And I feel bad about that because I probably gave them all the wrong impression. But, <laughs> man. <laughs> there's, a buffet, there's a buffet of ants at Lawson's. <laughs> Look, <laughs> this is all fun, but uh, <laughs> we have to talk about... We have to talk about Assassin's Creed revelations, but before we do that, Tim, I, I want to, I have something important to talk about. That's like, okay, it's really, it's really serious and important to me. I've been forgetting to mention this on the podcast for a couple of weeks, but I just, I have to give a shout out, uh, and, and a virtual audio hug to, to my marathon team, dude, to the marathon people. Cause they're doing a real kick-ass job running the 2020 marathon right now. If any of you guys listening aren't familiar, the marathon is basically this like advent calendar subreddit community event where we play a sequence a day for the now 60 days leading up to Valhalla. Uh, this is our seventh time doing it. And considering the, the marathon is more or less the entire reason I'm a part of the fan community at all. I just, you know, I want to give them some love. So I just want to give a little personal shout out to the marathon team. We got Treviso. He's doing a great job running the show as always. McKeisenbergler is awesome, uh, a, a good buddy, great dude. Uh, our adopted mother, White Wolf Whispers, has been <laughs> super duper helpful. Uh, she's been untangling the mess of Odyssey for us so that it can be part of the marathon. Uh, then there's English Butter doing some amazing work, putting all kinds dude, of cool dude, my favorite. video clips together. Dude, English Butter is making video clips on our Instagram. We have an Instagram. And there are video clips on it, and they're they're spectacular. 
And they're getting like one like because nobody knows we have an Instagram. So like, you know, <laughs> get on that, people. And uh, there's also Assassinus, big help. Just I just want to show him some love. Assassinus. Who isn't? <laughs> Who isn't? Yeah. So, marathon people, I love you. Mwah, 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 mwah. You're the best. You're the best. You're the best. And uh, please check out the marathon. Those of you listening, if you haven't already, that concludes my 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 message. I think it is worth mentioning, Lawson, that all of those people are particularly like great at what they do. But I think, but you mentioned that Treviso is doing a great job as always. Like Treviso does a great job at everything. Period. Even just existing, he does. Treviso a great job is like that. a Treviso has been running a whole other marathon on the side for the Watchdogs people. Really? It's it was like finding out he had a secret second family. <laughs> Like he's just been he's just been going on these business trips. That we just yeah he's been coming home late, working a lot of overtime. Yeah, but I, I respect it. You know, at a certain point, you don't you don't take it personally. You just respect the hustle. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So look, there's this game. It's called Assassin's Creed Revelations. Some of you might have heard of it. It's kind of the, we can finally talk about the namesake of our podcast, the Hook Blade. You know. In yeah, fact, shout out to McKeisenberger. He actually he gave us the name idea for Hook Blade, if you recall. Yeah, originally he wanted it to be Blade Hook. Yeah, which is like, I, you know, you're operating on too many meta levels there. It's already hard enough to explain to my family as it is. Because <laughs> I'll be like, people will be like, what, what's, a, what's, a, what's a Hook Blade? And I'm like, well, okay, so there's this line of dialogue. All right, like, so there's two parts, okay? And... <laughs> yeah, what am I supposed to say? Anyway... Dude, Revelations, it's really interesting because I've always known uh, for the duration of our decades-long friendship that Revelations is your favorite Assassin's Creed game, full stop. Full stop. And as you know, for me, I always respected it, I always appreciated it, and I always was glad that I had played it, but it didn't quite make the lasting impression on me as it did you um, because I was rushing through them. So I was really looking forward to the chance to sit down and play through Revelations again and really indulge in all of the all of the many wonderful things it has to offer. So I think we both had some. Did you manage to I know you said you wanted the hundred percent it. Did you end up hundred percenting it? I got to ninety two percent and Dude, that's fucking amateur hour. Or all I have left was the chests. And I, I just look, I, I can't be bothered to spend, you know, like hours just collecting chests you know it's just like the animus fragments are at the very least put in positions that you can like keep up momentum and get them while parkouring and stuff you can't really do sure. that with chests and so that was what i left behind but everything else i did i full synced it um i mean i would argue that you're a man of weak will but <laughs> i appreciate I, I wouldn't disagree the with effort you. that you made and i did by the way 100 percent yes chests yes, and yes. all you, you sure did. Um, definitely, which is a whole different way to experience the game than just crushing the main sequences and calling it a day. For sure, for sure. But if you had to explain to somebody what makes Revelations your your number one game of, of the franchise, what would you what would you say? Well, it was interesting because I, I, I definitely got to like be reacquainted with a lot of those things that I, I hold special about the game on this replay. It's been a little while and there were there were also some things that just you know like were fuzzy like like the little interludes of modern day dialogue that you can hear uh, in between sequences yeah. and stuff like I forgot that was a thing and so but anyway I do think because you have this very cinematic and like just impactful story that's also like elevated and delivered in a successful way by Darby's writing and yeah. so. You have like the game starts out and it's just like uh, you're having a, 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 a fucking carriage fight and you get flown off a, the side of a cliff through a bomb. And it's just it's all very like blockbustery. But I but I totally. feel like it's earned, you know, totally. And I think it represents Ezio in a very interesting part of his life, because as we just got done talking about with Brotherhood, yeah. Ezio is not the most interesting thing about that game. And right. I think. That was really interesting coming out of AC2 where he is very interesting. Then you have uh, Revelations where he's back to being the star of the show. You know, I yeah. mean, 
And I think giving him this like really cute, uh, you know, like little romance and stuff. And totally. Ezio's journey in this game is, I would say, more meaningful than it was in Two and Brotherhood because he's Ooh. trying to find his place in the world and he's trying to find his place in this conflict that he's, de- he's dedicated his life to. And yeah, he's kind of trying to figure out like what his legacy is in the in the story, right? The grand Absolutely. story of assassins versus Templars, like you know, and and I and I think a lot of that's actually, funnily enough, highlighted in the in one of the trailers, you know, where he's like writing a letter to Claudia, and he's like, yeah, you know, my story is one of many thousands, you know, and and he's he's growing tired of the fight because he doesn't know what the end game is, and then mm-hmm. you bring in Altair's perspective and influence and i just think it's a really interesting way to bring back ac1 like era totally. stuff it's like a bookend for ac1 and an altair story and Ezio story and it didn't need to happen that way i feel yeah. like you could have left altair in ac ac1 and you would have been fine with that and you could have probably left Ezio at brotherhood and people would have been fine with that too right and this game provides like you know a very beautiful ending to both of their legacies because yeah Ezio while he's discovering like what is my place in all of this he's also discovering like what Altair's place was in all of it and yeah that's a really good point it's interesting to see Altair in a much different light than we saw him in AC1 because I always say that like that this was the coordinated effort to bring Altair into like legendary character status because yeah because you have AC1, which which leaves a lot to be desired. But then you have the book Secret Crusade, which came out the same year as the game. And you have the Masaf keys that show Altair in such a different... Like, both of these, to me, a coordinated effort to make Altair, like, interesting and, 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 and uh, relatable and compassionate. And yeah. the both of these things really play into each other very well because you can play Revelations and you get a complete story there. You get a complete, like, beginning, middle, and end for Altair in those Masaf keys, which is... Not an easy feat, but then you can read the book and you can get the added context to all those things. Gotcha. Sure, sure. And plus you have, I feel like they're working well with the the things that they establish in like the codex pages about his life and the sequence of events. Yeah, I mean, even if you go back and read the codex pages of AC2, you, you can see that even in that game, they were trying to bring Altair up a little bit. Like yeah. the way that he, his writings and stuff, you know, like they're just... They represent a different person than what we saw in AC1, and this game continues that tradition, I think. It's definitely easy to imagine for me that if like, if, if everything we, we knew about Altair began and ended with AC1, that the way the, the fans feel about him would, would be significantly different, I think, today. For sure. I mean, if you look back, like... AC1 kind of ends and, and it's not very definitive on like what Altair's life was going to look like beyond that, but then you have the codex pages in AC2... And even still, in the codex pages, like they, they pretty much you know they, they they do paint Altair in a very respectful light, and it shows that he started a lot of, a lot of the traditions that have been continued. However, like you read you read his database entry in Revelations, and it's like this dude is like the great like, is like the father of the assassins and stuff, you know, and it's like he's definitely uh, his status is earned through these. Uh, things that we see him because we see him take up the mantle as mentor in this game and also in the book and i don't want to go too too much into the book you know because sure you know it's not really it's not it's not this game it's not pertinent but um there is like the book i didn't like altair until i read the book and i think a lot of right. people may not may forget that the book came out you know years after the game did and you know it was yeah. it was to accompany this this game so yeah it's just it made and i i think to me and this might be controversial like it without if it was just ac2 let's just, okay i'll say this if it, if it was just ac2 and ac brotherhood i don't think Ezio would be regarded as like one of the, like you know like oh he's like the best video game protagonist of all time i think revelations really bumps him into that league i don't know if you agree but i i think i would in fact i was just thinking a moment ago too like if brotherhood hadn't existed and they just took a year off instead I know everyone. I know. I know y'all love Brotherhood. Believe me, I do. I'm not. I'm not trying to take anything away from you, but of the three games, certainly two and Revelations, they just they play more of a role in defining who the character is. AC two it establishes him. Revelations is almost like this culmination of his arc that 
you didn't even necessarily know he was on until they decided to go that route for the third game. But it just it casts the the whole sequence of events leading up to it in his life in a, in a slightly different and, and more interesting light, knowing the version of him that he grows up to be. Yeah, definitely. Like that. That's the kind of thing that makes a character st- stick out and, and stay with you when you get to, to really see them in all the different stages yeah. of their life. They they become a more whole, a more complete representation of a human being, I think. You know, I think if AC2 and Revelations were just like the two Ezio games that we got, it would yeah. it would be perfectly reasonable. Yeah, and I think he would like, still enjoy the same legacy oh, that yeah. he does. Like, if you ended AC2 and you just booted up Re- Re- Revelations, I mean, like, wouldn't that be like a nice little trilogy, AC1, AC2, and Revelations? You know, like... It, you know, it anyway. kind of would. Especially because, and I guess this is a good segue into one of the things I wanted to talk about, especially because... You know, obviously, Brotherhood and Revelations are very similar. They're damn near the same engine, but because Revelations puts a lot of work into setting itself apart, you know, aesthetically with this completely different setting and and in all of the sort of ways that it builds a unique tone for itself, it feels a lot more distinct from AC2 in the sense that, like, I feel like, oh, my gosh, if you'd gone from playing AC2 to just playing Revelations... You know, that's a huge jump. And then having Brotherhood in the middle, having a lot of those systemic similarities to Revelations, it makes it less of a big jump and more of a, like, smooth transition. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting thought, because if you did go from AC2 to AC Revelations, I think you'd be like, wow, wow like, what an updated version. Yeah, absolutely. All the same things that you feel when you, when you boot up Brotherhood, where you're like, wow, I'm playing AC2, but better. Instead of thinking you're playing AC2 but better and then playing AC Brotherhood but different, it'd be, wow, I'm playing a new Assassin's Creed game that's totally different. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I completely agree with that. I think that's actually a very, like, astute observation. You know, you're so you're so sweet, Tim. You really are. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. You know, and I think when we're talking about how this game sets itself apart, I mean, just the beginning of the game when you're in Masyaf and just yeah. the change in atmosphere and weather makes it a completely different experience than when you're in Masyaf in the very first game. It really sets itself apart, I think, primarily with its tone. I think you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said blockbustery, because I was going to describe it as cinematic, and and almost it feels to me like 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 Revelations has the style and sensibilities of like an action adventure movie. You know, by by sort of focusing on the set pieces and you have that sort of quick fun dialogue that Darby McDevitt is so good at writing that really gives it a a feel that I would say is wholly unique from AC one and AC two and AC brotherhood. I completely agree. And I, I do have a theory as to, well, not so much a theory, but I do have an idea as to why that is like in brotherhood, a lot of those cinematic moments are reserved for the Leonardo missions. And in the main story, yeah. there's not a whole lot of cinematic moments. But in Revelations, there's one, like, every sequence. And you have to keep in mind, interestingly enough, that, like, one of the things that contributes to that is that instead of the tombs being um, side content, they're worked into the story of Revelations, which is yes. genius because it, it does wonders for the pacing. And the tombs in Revelations are the best tombs in all of the Ezio games. Yeah, I was, well, I would say they're, they're the best tombs that we've gotten, period. Considering we've only gotten tombs in the Ezio games, I think we just said the same thing. Well, not, well, not, well, okay, not, not tombs, but like, you know, like parkour no, I, puzzles I know. I'm, and stuff. I'm being shitty. You're totally right. <laughs> the tombs in Revelations, you're never going to have more fun with a parkour system in Assassin's Creed than, than you will in, in the tombs of Revelations, for sure. If Unity had tried to do tombs, maybe different story, but they didn't even think about doing that for whatever reason. So go figure. You know, and, I don't want to be talking out of school here, but I I think some of the two missions like even come across as like like an Indiana Jones movie. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I think that where say the tombs in AC two and Brotherhood, they're either puzzle like in nature or they're chase sequences. Sometimes a little bit of both. But Revelations, they go out of their way to have things constantly collapsing around you, a real sense of momentum and speed and adventure. And unpredictability that just makes them, they're great to look at, they're fun to play. Just talking about them makes me want to boot the game back up and, and 
just do the tombs again. Yeah, I mean, just a matter of you feel, feeling like you are interacting with the environment, having things fall around you and, and, and the things crumbling at, uh, because of your weight. Yeah. And it makes it that much more like exhilarating when you successfully get out. The other thing that lends the game that cinematic tone and feel is the music. Because they have Lauren Balf step in as the composer. And what what Lauren chooses to do with the sound in this game is like the complete opposite of what Jesper Kidd is doing in the other games, which is, you know, those soundtracks are great too, but there's definitely a difference between the kind of music that you're hearing. It's also the only soundtrack, admittedly, that I will just idly listen to. Right. It's really good. Yeah. It's so good. It's, it's the best. Really, yeah. It's the best. It totally just, I was noticing it all the time that it was creating this very unique headspace for, for what was happening where you kind of, you, you just feel like you're being an action movie hero a little bit. Yeah. And I, I mean, it, it's a go off of that. Like I do think in terms of like when we were playing brotherhood, there are times where Ezio yeah. is like being a badass and it's cool, but do I believe it necessarily? I don't, I don't know. Like, in this game, though, when Ezio is being a badass, it's like, I believe it. You know, he's tough yeah. as nails and it's a, and it works and, it, and it's sold very well. And I think it comes together with the tone and the writing and everything. It, it Everything, it just takes itself seriously. So when Ezio says something like, I am only the most interesting man in your life, it's like, you are. I agree with you. <laughs> and yeah, you're the most interesting man in the world, Ezio. Yeah. It, it's also funny, too, to go back to AC2. And to see him like kind of being, you know, like a lovable, like kind of fool when it yeah. comes to flirting. And then in this game, yeah. he's like the most suave guy in the world. Oh, yeah. Because like with Christina, I remember when he's like, a minute yeah. is, all, is all I need. <laughs> you a know? minute is all I need. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, as, as old Ezio or old Ezio, if you will, Sophia. <laughs> yeah. And, and so like you can have Ezio like fucking parachuting through the city and you can have him like doing all these awesome things because it's earned, you know? And yet also what part of what gives him a, a lot, a lot of depth in this game is the sense of humility. When he's saying to Sophia, when Sophia offers him to come with her to see a printing press, he's like, you know, I would love to, but my time is running short. And I don't, and I, I, I always read that more than just, oh, I'm running out of time to get these Masyaf keys. I read it as, I'm running out of time to even be doing this. Like, I need to see this through. Yeah. And yeah. I think his, you know, his growing love for Sophia obviously allows him to, to, to keep her around. But it's always like, it's also performed so beautifully from Roger Craig Smith, you know? And it's like, it's so spot on totally. because he's like, like, yeah, just, I, 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 I love it when he's just like, my time is running short. You know, it's like he's he he doesn't he love it. He doesn't he doesn't like it, but he's he has to come to terms with it. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. I don't know what you think. But. No, I think I think that's all there. I think it's all it's all in the text. And I think that uh, that that's what makes it so so resonant and effective since, you know, we've been kind of gushing about this game for like half an hour. I'd like to I'd like to to put forth my complaints. Yeah, there definitely are some consequences to some of the blockbuster stuff but go ahead yeah that's a good point if we're talking about mainly story things right now i my take on the story and i think i maybe suggested this a little bit too in the ranking episode is that honestly i think if i were to sum up my feelings about this game in a headline it would be that this game achieves every single goal that it sets for itself and then some in some cases right? You can tell what their intentions were when it came to the story and the tone and the design of the game. And you can tell that for, for pretty much all of those intentions, they knocked it out of the park. I do think that naturally, if you aim for that sort of blockbuster action adventure movie storytelling, you do get a little bit of things getting kind of bogged down in plot. Now, luckily they handle it well enough that in terms of momentum, you never feel like it's dragging or that you're, that it's losing steam. But when it's relying on those sort of easier elements of like revelations or, or twists about who's really a good guy, who's really a bad guy, sort of your typical like thriller plot mechanics, it's going to be harder to create lasting emotional impressions compared to say something like AC2, which is not really in the thriller mold 
the way that that Revelations is, right? Revelations, it's it's set piece heavy, it's full of fun conversations and fun dialogue, but outside of I would say the beginning and the end of the game, you don't get super high emotional stakes, you don't get super high, you know, drama storytelling wise. So while I would enjoy playing this game more, maybe than say AC2 on a story level, AC2 gives me a lot more sort of moments that that last and linger in my brain. There's a lot about the story in Revelations that I've already forgotten about. Things that have to do with like Suleiman's brother or uncle or whomever was the sultan. Yeah. Like I I've flushed that stuff from my brain already because it didn't really matter. I think I I think I disagree with you. Come on, dude, really? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're, you're dude, wait, really? Me. What the fuck? Obviously the beginning is amazing as far as setting the stage for Ezio's personal journey and connection to Altair, right? And a lot of the Altair moments are particularly memorable. And the ending is is really well done because the ending kind of the whole relationship between Ezio and Desmond, going from Beautiful. Desmond being this name that he hears and that he doesn't understand to realizing that his role in this whole thing is as a vessel for another hero in another time, right? That's perfect. That's beautiful. That's the kind of thing that you feel like only Assassin's Creed could do. That's a story only uh, Assassin's Creed could I'm tell, getting like right? misty eyed. I'm getting misty eyed just kind of thinking about it. It's so good. <laughs> it's great. Just because the the sort of understanding that he comes to about Desmond. For him to have the humility to just be like, like, I've seen enough, you know, and, and this yeah. is this is enough for you, and maybe you'll make my suffering worth something in the end. You know, yeah. that's all that that's all I can ask for. You know, it's just it's it is so Good. But for me, I have to count it as a slight weakness that when it comes to like, if you ask me about this game in, in five years, I'll remember the very beginning of it and the very end of it. And there'll be a lot in between that I don't remember at all, which I, I can't say is true about AC2. AC2, I've never forgotten, uh, you know, Venice, Rosa, Antonio, Leonardo, like I could pretty much recreate the whole sequence of events in that game from my from my head, and it's because of how emotionally invested I am in Ezio's goals and growth throughout that process. I mean, I think that's totally fair. I, I like obviously, you know, beginning and end very strong, but I do think there's a lot in the middle. Like even Pelea Lagos assassination, you know, like his confession, like like there's a lot of like very like well delivered dialogue there and you'd have to remind me right now who that is he is he's the like he was the heir to the byzantine throne and he's the leader of the templars at the moment in in cappadocia Ezio's like i think i i, I kind of remember that Ezio's like there he is the monster i came to kill yeah he's he, he's big beard that's like santa yeah yeah okay I, also I shakulu thanks shakulu who's like the best multiplayer character in this game by the way like he's <laughs> dope. He's great. I like him. Like I don't know. There's just uh, and it's like I also love um, Prince Suleiman's uh, Prince Ahmed, right? Yeah, and I, I'll I'll say also that like as far as supporting cast goes, something we talk about a lot in regards to these games when they're strong, when they're weak. Sophia and Suleiman being the main supporting characters in this game, they're both great and they're both pretty memorable. There's plenty um, of good supporting characters. I mean Yusuf. Like everyone loves him, and he's he's in the he's in a couple sequences of the game. Yeah, he has actually less of a role than I expected from the beginning of the game. But when he died, I was legitimately sad about it. Right, hundred percent. Yeah, it worked. And and you know, and that's the thing too is I also think Ahmet, while he be, kind of becomes a villain, like kind of becomes a villain at a very convenient time for the story. I do think there's like there's plenty of interaction with him that Etsu has, and I'm really only addressing one scene here. Where you go to Ahmet and you're like, where the fuck is Sophia, dog? And he's like, you know, why are you doing all this assassin business? You know, the Templars, we're where it's at. But he says it in a way, like there's there's one line that's I think very memorable. And he's like, he's like, when you're standing amongst the ashes, you know, you, Ezio Aditore, can say that you stayed true to your creed. And like, there's stuff like that, yeah. that were the... I think Darby does well is the dichotomy between assassin and Templar. Like, where is that line? He handles drawn? the nuance of it beautifully. Right. And so while I do agree with you that like whenever I think about the most impactful thing of this game to me, I think about the ending, obviously. But I yeah. do think that there is plenty peppered out through the, through the middle and stuff. 
And you know, it's it's kind of an equally, and I guess we'll get into that. But it it, it isn't a super long game, but it feels no like a lot. Ha- excuse me, it feels like a lot happens. Yeah, when it's only a couple months of time, really. But it feels like yeah, it feels like they, years. They do a me. lot with less. I but I I, I kind of want to. I I think this could be a good way for us to get into some of the consequences of the blockbuster feel. Before before we go completely off of this. I'm going to ask you one question that, and and this may blow up in my face, but it might also make my point. Everything that you've quoted at me or referenced to me as things that happen in the middle of the game that aren't the beginning or ending, but that strike you as memorable. Could you have described those things to me the same way before we did this replay of Revelations? Uh, well, with Manu, with at least the Palea Lagos, I, I, I think I would have. I also, like, I always okay. have a soft spot for Shakulu. Um, okay. there's definitely, like, bits and pieces that I got a refresher on this time around. Right. But, like, I always did like, you know, Ezio's relationship with Sophia forming and how, you know, he has that change of pace where he goes and picks her flowers and stuff and it's just yeah. there's a lot like it's 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 a blockbuster movie but it also has a lot of personal moments to it like Altair and you know Altair and Maria and just there's a lot of little personal interactions Altair and and and, and Dareem, his son like there's and, uh, and Al- Abbas too and Abbas as well you know yeah. and you know there are little personal moments like that and you know it's like when Ezio is kind of like talking about the creed when they're walking up to Masyaf and stuff, like I think it does slow down a little bit there, and sure, and it and it and it does work for me. Um, but I think I think on the other side of that coin, you have you have the consequences. You know, like to me, the most egregious example is to kind of fulfill like you know a big explosive escape that Ezio has to make. Ezio. Mm-hmm makes this really neglectful choice to like endanger yeah. citizens in this city. And it's like, what the fuck was yeah. that all about? You know, like people definitely died from that. Well, they, 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 they make it a point to tutorial and say, Hey, how about you use Eagle sense to get out of this burning uh, cave? What about people right. who can't do that? What about people who aren't that fortunate? You know, that's the fact about the Assassin's Creed universe. Everyone has Eagle vision, dude. That actually explains why the guards in AC three detect you immediately all the time. <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> we'll no, save no. that for later i mean that is true though but yeah it's just that was silly and it's definitely not a high point of the game like for all our talk about Ezio, like you know actually having consequences that's one thing where he doesn't suffer any consequences for cappadocia in general i had interestingly different feelings about this time around i remember loving it the first time i played revelations i was like Oh my god, dude. Underground city. This is dope. And then I felt like this time around, I maybe because I'm just paying more attention to like the the story pacing and things like that. It I did it did feel like that's one moment where the momentum slowed down. Mainly because one thing I was really invested in at that point was the dynamic between him and Sophia. It gets to a point in the story where Finally, Sophia has been looped in on things and she's getting involved with things. And that's something you kind of want to see from the get go. And then the moment that she's really able to start participating in the actual events of the story in a way that will be interesting to me, uh, he goes to an underground city and he's talking to completely different people. And it almost felt like, you know, if someone told me this was a, a DLC add on the same way that Battle of Forley and Bonfire of the Vanities were like that would have made sense to me. So I guess I have a problem with it on that level, but I do still love the whole vibe of the underground city. So I can't complain too much. Yeah. I mean, I got to say, like, I agree with you, but at the same time, like I it didn't feel like it was a, it was a complete like pacing blow. No, it's not. It's not certainly not as egregious as those AC two DLCs. Right. And there is certainly like, you know, where you go in there and it's like, okay, go, go, go get this key and go free the girl and do this and that. And like, but you, but you, you, it, it focuses up real quick when you kill Shakulu and you can, you kill Pelea Lagos and you get his key. And then Prince Ahmed is like, Hey, you fuck, we're going to go interrogate Sophia. And then it gets right back yeah. on track. So it's not that big of a diverging thing. And they pay off the, the Sophia involvement thing. Cause then you get, you know, it is kind of a, a damsel in distress situation with her, but she, she ends up once she's like, 
on the carriage and, and she's like, you know, she's holding her own and shit. She's doing the thing that you want to see her do the whole game. She's yeah. getting involved. Anyway. That's pretty much my big gripe with the story is the Capitocha fire thing. But ultimately, yeah. other than that, I, I think it handled itself really well. And sure. You know, and I, and I, I do think it came out of like, OK, so how can we get Ezio to like flee from the city? Well, just cause an explosion. Right. How do we force him out of here and right. keep things moving? You know, and like in that same vein, though, like there's so many set pieces like that in the game that do work, like like fall, like falling down a fucking mountain fighting Achmet in midair like that's fucking that was insane. sick dude it's insane dude it doesn't like, fight hell yeah that would never happen in ac2 but it, it, it it's no. it, just, it feels so at home it in this fits game. perfectly in revelations and you know another thing that you reminded me of that i wanted to shout out is just the fact that like darby is uniquely talented at imbuing every conversation with interest and importance um so things that happen like in recruit missions and, and master assassin missions or, or interactions that you're having with, with any character in the game, really, he just, he makes it interesting. He gets as much as he can out of the time that they allow him to, to put his words on. Oh his. yeah, dude. I mean, a hundred percent. I'm, I'm still thinking about how Yusuf was like, when were you ever young? Yeah. <laughs> When were you ever young? There you go. Also, Lawson, what might be worth mentioning about Darby is Darby was uniquely suited to do the Altair bookend thing because yeah. making Altair interesting was kind of a job for Darby when he when he when he did uh when he did uh the the handheld mm. game bloodlines yeah yeah so like making Altair and Maria and all those characters interesting yeah. was was kind of like something that he was always uniquely capable of doing yeah you're totally right dude i you know so uh, also i think is worth mentioning too is i i i don't i i'd be remiss to not mention modern day while the modern day in this game is i would agree with you that it's like a bottle episode it's not much happens but the dialogue between desmond and clay is is so great. It, is it would so be good. considered though. It'd be considered a good bottle episode, you know, in a TV show, because yeah, you're right. The relationship between Clay and Desmond is is interesting, and you know, that's a super strange dynamic. And just like, uh, you know, the ending with Ezio, another thing that's true about the whole the whole storyline between Desmond and Clay, which is brilliantly paying off things that have been now set up for two games in a row, three games in a row is that it's a story only Assassin's Creed could do, right? Here's a dude trapped inside a computer, Tron style, uh, with someone who will never get out because their physical body is dead and is is having these conversations with him about purpose and and what, what kind of relationship do you have with someone who is going to be jealous of the fact that you have a, a real life and a real body to return to and this is temporary for you? while he's permanently doomed to this that you know that's it's cool i think the weakness of it is it relies really heavily on you know sort of invented concepts for this game that they obviously couldn't set up earlier in advance and that they have to have time passing the way that it is they have to have him in this coma the the creation of the animus island as a plot device you know it's not really building off of anything that we've seen before unfortunately but I appreciate it for all the same reasons you do. He's also resentful of Desmond because, you know, like Clay's Clay's life ended rather insignificantly, but here he is having to sacrifice himself in Abstergo to like leave messages to help Desmond. Yeah. So he's resentful because he's like, well, fuck, you know, like now I, now I got to help this, this fuck face. I don't even know. Dude, you just unlocked, dude, you just unlocked something about this game. We're about to hit him with a banger, dude. You know what you just realized, or or at least you made me realize, is that Clay is playing the same role in this story that Ezio is. That they are realizing that they're not the chosen ones necessarily, and that all they can do with their lives is lay the groundwork for Desmond to save the world. The only yeah, the only thing Clay can do is to pass on his memories. Which which Ezio uniquely did to Desmond yeah. because Clay passes on his memories when he touches him, and then he pushes yeah. and, and, and then he pushes him away to safety. Like that's yeah. that's basically what what Ezio was doing for 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 uh, you know Desmond to do in the future. So Clay is just sort of a thematic reflection of the same role that Ezio is playing in this game. 
That's Darby, man. Darby's just he's playing he's playing 4D chess with us all the time. <laughs> and we can't even perceive it. Our monkey brains, dude, we're just not we're not equipped. But he's doing it. He's putting it there. I gotta say, I didn't make that connection to Ezio, but I think it's spot on. Like, you know, because obviously, like, you know, Clay, you know, did say, like, okay, well, fuck it, I guess. And he, you know, left messages for Desmond and he made a sacrifice for Desmond. But yeah, I mean, you're totally right. It's like Clay is realizing I'm never getting out of here. I can't do anything about it. So the best I can do is to try and help Desmond. Yeah, that's what both of them are, are doing. In and the for also the hope of mankind, too. You know, yeah. because Desmond is the one who can save them. And, and I think also what's interesting about it is Clay is clearly resentful, but he, he I feel like he's almost like giving Desmond the opportunity to prove him wrong. He's like, I want to know if you regret anything. And yeah. then Desmond is honest with him. And Clay is just so happy for someone to be straight with him for once, you know? Yeah. And he's like, just thank you for making sense. And he, and he, and he disappears and like, Moments like that are just, I, I don't know, it's its what saves us modern day from just being like a, you know, for, forgetful to me. From being a complete piss in the for, bucket. To or being a complete waste of time. Yeah. Sure. So, not to do a huge whiplash 180 on you, but I have to talk about some gameplay things. No, yeah, I, I want to get to some of the gameplay stuff too, so it works out. So, like, I talked a lot in our Brotherhood episode about the idea of, like, what role are the systems playing in the game, the systems that are separate from the core pillars? You know, in this game, you have assassin recruits, bomb crafting, you have den defense. I think that's pretty much it as far as these extraneous systems. Uh, well, you know, there's also the economy, right? Right. There you go. I, be I feel like even though there are aspects of these systems that I enjoy more, obviously the, the assassin recruit system is... A lot more fleshed out. You get to actually have missions with them. Some of them get to be actual characters. Obviously, that's better. Way better, right? Ultimately, though, I felt like they took a lot more time than even the Brotherhood ones did out of the playthrough and created even more of a sense that the only things that those systems were accomplishing in the grand scheme of the game was padding the length and i have some specific thoughts about i mean obviously den defense is not super popular and no one's gonna be uh offended on behalf of den defense if i say right now that it fucking sucks and i avoid it like the plague they also they also kind of force you to participate in the den defense systems for for at least a little while because it takes a few minutes in the in the game to actually level up your mat your assassins enough to properly defend a den without den defense and they whatever the opposite of nerfing is they do that to the whole notoriety system so the notoriety system becomes artificially more of a pain in the ass to manage because it's what drives the den defense, right? You can't, you can't remove posters anymore. Um, you can't take any actions uh, as far as notoriety reduction until you reach a threshold, right? If um, the heralds, I think, remove 25%, you can't be at 13% notoriety and bribe a herald to get rid of it. You have to be at 25% at least. Um, same goes for 50% with the, um, whatever they're called, the, the politicians, the officials, kill, yeah. which literally can I completely honest with you? I didn't see a single one until I was well past done with the main story. Part of that, because I, I managed my notoriety pretty closely, but there were a lot of things about the intricacies as far as how the assassins and the, the master assassins and the dens relate to the den defense system that I wasn't really, and this is partially because I'm a dummy, I wasn't really able to figure out until like way after I should have figured it out or things that I figured out from Google or people talking about it, right? So like there are some kind of design awkwardnesses in a lot of these systems, especially now the recruit system, when you're actually managing, sending them on missions and their XP and their leveling up. It's not clear, for instance, to me, the reason why, uh, until a certain point, why I would have all of these level 10 assassins that would be having 50,000 XP but not leveling up at all. And the answer is because, oh, well, you only have seven dens and therefore only seven master assassins. But to figure that out after I've sent all of these level 10 assassins on so many missions that I didn't have to do, you know, a bit of a frustration, right? Um, yeah. I have some pretty strong feelings about the bomb 
crafting system because I'm of the opinion that it's a complete waste of time outside of the fact that it gives you a smoke bomb, a, a, a powder bomb, and a cherry bomb, basically, which, you know, powder bombs and cherry bombs, which are very useful stealth tools, didn't really exist in AC up to this point, and they're super useful here. However, if the game had stripped out the bomb manufacturing, the bomb crafting entirely, and just gave me a black powder bomb and a cherry bomb, a smoke bomb would have been much simpler, would have been much less of a hassle and just a strange time sink into something. Because even though there's a lot of cool effects and, you know, special sort of things you can do with them, I would say at least half of the different kinds of bombs you can create are either completely redundant to other bombs you can create or objectively worse and therefore bombs you would not want to create. So at that point, what a waste of time. Yeah, I think I came around, like, I do think you can easily bypass it by just buying the Black Merchant bombs pre-made. Which eventually I did, right. for sure. And so, but I'm not saying, like, oh, well, this, the bad system is actually good because you can bypass it. You know, I just... Right, you're not Jacers. <laughs> I just think, yeah, I'm not, I'm not about to say, hey, just super blend. Uh, <laughs> well, the great thing about AC1 Parkour is that you can choose not to do it. We're sorry, Jasers. We love you. We're just teasing you. It's all friendly. Don't, don't, don't be hurt. <laughs> um, have you heard about vaulting today? Yet? <laughs> but I did have fun with it. But yeah, it's not. This is the thing, right? Is if bombs weren't just going to disappear next year, you know, and they were going to be completely gone, I feel like they would have been more integrated better. Uh, however, yeah, I didn't have the greatest time with it. Um, I also, yeah. I feel like a solution I would have given to the bombs is like, let's say you could hold 12 bombs and you can divvy out between the three bombs or three bomb types, which ones you want to carry. If you want to equally, that would have been super interesting. It would have been an extra layer of complexity to an already over complex system. But I, I like the idea anyway. Well, what I think is cause like, okay, so let's say if I really love the lethal bombs and I want to hold on. To 12 lethal bombs that's what i can do if i want to divvy them out between lethal and tactical i could do that and so what i think it does is it it, it it adheres to you know a certain play style which is what this these games started to really like doing yeah and it also allows you to carry more bombs at a time so that way you're not constantly going back and interacting with the cumbersome bomb crafting mechanic so actually honestly tim that alone if you did just that and not the ability to craft your own different types of the three main bomb archetypes, that alone would have been more interesting because yeah, then choosing if I can hold nine bombs, how many of them are going to be tactical? How many of them are going to be distracting? How many of them are going to be, that would have been like decision-making that matters. What doesn't matter is whether this bomb is going to explode on impact or stick to somebody. You know what I mean? What doesn't matter is, is the cloud going to be big or, or, or really big? Even though I had fun with, with like, you know, sti like sticky pouches, there's just trip wire pouches and stuff like that was fine. Sure. But most of the time I just picked impact shells because that was the easiest. Cause it's easier. And, it's more predictable. And it really just came down to like, I kept having to go back. Like that's why in the tutorial bomb mission, they give you like three different you know, little bomb areas to craft in because they know that you're going to go through them like candy. Okay, so either they do this. Either they say, okay, these are your bomb types and here's what you're going to use and you choose which ones you want to take with you and you get 12 or 9 or whatever. Or they make it a really, like, you know, a, a really intricate system and there's like a thousand bomb opportunities and could, because then it's rewarding if you stick with it. Th this limbo that's in right now, it's not so rewarding. And I found myself... Yeah dreading every time i had to go make a new bomb because i wished oh, yeah, that i could just i don't know fucking do it in the, in, in the pause screen you know like yeah because it's just it's well you actually can did you know that you can make them in the pause screen i believe in the inventory screen you can craft them interesting right I, I wasn't aware of that i might be wrong but that's how i feel i remember like discovering that by accident and being like what the fuck was i doing interesting. but anyway um so i'm sure someone will tell me i'm wrong <laughs> um but like i yeah i think we've kind of 
explored the bomb thing in depth. Yes. I will say that it's something that I have to mention as far as the strengths game gameplay wise in this game, partially, yeah, doing part two the way that they expanded on bombs. Stealth feels so much more possible in this game than it does in any other Ezio game. Yeah, 100%. I think, I think Eagle Sense adds some interesting moments to it. Totally. I think. This is my favorite interpretation of Eagle Vision in any of the games yeah. so far. I'm surprised it's completely confined to this one game. I liked having to evaluate targets to find who the person was. I liked being able to trace the path. You can trace the path of a target in um, Origins and, and Odyssey, but you're doing it as your bird, and it's just not as cool. Right, and it also adds to the. It also adds one more layer of, like, Ezio is old and experienced and this is why he has like dude if you got into a borgia tower and you started just following the path which would be a really long path and managing to stay undetected using social stealth from the guards in in those restricted areas you could catch up with the target by following the path stab him from behind and then you know essentially just pull it off flawlessly that's like one of the first times in the franchise that you really get to have a satisfying stealth experience yeah it's like the right balance between Something that is set up for you, it's designed for you, but also is, you know, giving you the freedom to approach it how you want to. So it's well, it's really well done. I completely agree. And I also think when it comes to some of the level design, it's definitely more, it definitely caters to like, you know, like some of them are definitely open to like, you just do it how you want to. The, the, the main example that I think you and I both can pull from is the Sophia cargo mission, you know, like. Yeah, we can both yeah. just we can both just waltz in there and do it how we want to. And I feel like I found a really unique path, and I and that worked for me. That allowed me to get on the ship and get out really quickly. And I'm not saying it's like a black box mission, but it's unprecedented yeah. at, the, at the least. It's super good, and even AC three pretty much never is able to give you that same empowering feeling that you know what all of your tools are and you know how to use them. And you know the conditions and the obstacles that you're up against and just having that puzzle like experience of figuring out how you're going to tackle it and, you know, how you're going to make it unique to you. The other thing I want to point out that I'm surprised we didn't say at the very beginning, you know, is that this is also, in my opinion, I know that some of our friends will disagree the the most fun you can have with parkour in an Ezio game, because the hook blade adds so much depth to the moment to moment gameplay as far as the speed at which you can climb things, the way you can use the zip lines, the lamp jumps and all of these other things. Um, there's just a lot uh, of richness to it, and it really makes you feel like you're in control of your movements. Plus, the city is designed to take advantage of the movement system. The city is it's dense. It's the buildings are tall. They're well spaced out. You have these routes between places that are really clearly defined, especially with the zip lines, and you can just run wild. And and as I told you many times, this is the only game in the franchise other than Unity that I could just boot it up, run around for 45 minutes with a podcast on, and have a great time with no destination, no collectible grabbing, just running across rooftops, fighting some guards, doing some emergent things, and and having a great time. I, yeah, I mean, I'm right there with you on that. And I think it's interesting because it's really surprising to me that for it being a brand new mechanic in the last of the Ezio games that all play pretty similarly, and and it's a brand new mechanic, and it works beautifully. And the thing is, is the hook blade bleeds into every part, every pillar of the game. You have your tactical stuff where you can pull down scaffolding, and you can, like, you know, uh, like launch yourself over guards with it. And it works perfectly. So I've never had a problem with it. You can use it in combat. You can use it to steal things. You can use it to counter people with. And, and it's just, it's so effective. And you can use it in your navigation because the city, like you said, is designed in a way that takes advantage of it. And it's so it's not like, it's not just brotherhood with a hook blade. This feels very unique to Revelations, no, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you couldn't put the hook blade on in Rome and have a great time. Absolutely not. It, everything is meticulously designed to benefit your use of the hook blade, like you said, with the lamps and with the zip lines. But also, just like, I don't really know a word besides just to say it's really cool that I can <laughs> do a lamp jump and know that the game is. Design in a way that I know I'm going to land on somewhere advantageous when I'm done with the lamp jump. 
I also think it's it, it, was, it was I think it was such a big risk because AC2 and AC and, and, and Brotherhood they're very specifically Italian games and then you have Revelations which brings in a whole new setting excuse me and it brings in a whole new like architecture style and they beautifully built around it and they and they made it work you know and honestly like it's one of the best like open worlds that I've experienced period like just walking yeah it, da- down the street in this game I, I I know that you mentioned that you really like the atmosphere of this game I mean it is so it is so prevalent like I booted I booted up the game and I just was standing and there was a guy doing hookah next to me they added in a little hookah sound effect to the guy <laughs> like did they need to do yeah. that absolutely not and they did and it's amazing and it's just it's such a beautiful city and I think it was a risk because they could have just done another Italian setting and they didn't. Totally. And it really fucking paid off. Just the atmosphere around Constantinople as you're just walking through the streets. Definitely, to me, it's by far my favorite city in the Ezio trilogy. As great as Florence is, as great as Venice is, it's like, I just, I I love it. I could boot it up and, and just have a great time right now in yeah. my 100% save file just right around I, I think it's definitely my favorite map in the series and i think too where it kind of benefits from rome remember how i pointed out how like it's kind of interesting how the games that don't have horses are the better games for parkour yeah like it's kind of interesting how rome did a, did a lot of things to like be accessible for horses and then in the very next game they could have did the same thing but then the, but they decided not to and the game benefited because of it Totally, and you get that sort of effect that I feel like you definitely get in, in say, Florence and Venice, where you start to feel like you know the city. Like, you start to memorize some landmarks, and you start to get your bearings for which way things are, that at a certain point, you know, you go, oh, I just need to head in that direction, and I'll get to the ferries that'll take me across to the Galata District. Right. You know what I mean? And it's just, you know, look, man, I'll say it. Revelations... (laughs) <laughs> it's pretty good i i do want to mention one last thing if i may absolutely i i i sh- i have to mention multiplayer and i know do you have to <laughs> and i know that unfortunately you didn't get to play it but to, i will to, never to... know what it's like to enjoy the sweet sweet release of assassin's creed revelations multiplayer i just want to say that it is still like just one, it's still the best multiplayer experience I had. Um, I really enjoyed it when when I was able to, to play and and I uh, it was it was Brotherhood it was Brotherhood multiplayer but polished. Um, it just worked so well. My go to character was Shakuli, which you could probably assume. Yeah, everything was just everything was just firing on 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 all cylinders and so many cylinders. You know, it's just. I don't know. You can probably cut this out entirely. I just I wanted to mention. Like, I won't. This, I won't, Tim. I won't do that to you. Well, cut this part out then, because sometimes you like to leave in the part where I say to cut it out. I look like a fool. (laughs) Um, I typically don't. (laughs) I just want to say that I I love this multiplayer. Um, I'm glad it existed. I'm glad I got to play it. Tim, if you love uh, Assassin's Creed Revelations multiplayer so much, why don't you marry it? Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. Also... (laughs) Also, the like the fucking like the official introduction of Daniel Cross in the multiplayer cutscenes that you get. Yeah. Daniel Cross and Otto Berg, like the first official fucking introduction of these people. Yeah, it's a good point. I almost forgot about that shit. Because I'm pretty sure uh the fall came out after Revelations, right? Same year. Anyway, yeah, just uh fucking overall, it's still my favorite, and I think it'll always be my favorite, and I love it, and I hope people love it just as much as I do, and I hope that everyone can c- come together in the comments and just unify over their love of Revelations. I want hate mail. I want to see someone who hates Revelations, and I want them to, to hit me with some facts and logic about it. That's what I I'd want. be interested in that, because... It's not a very hateable game. I can right. see someone thinking it's maybe insubstantial, but right. I would disagree with that. I, like, like, I feel like most people don't even dislike it. They just maybe think it's worth skipping, you know? So Right, exactly, yeah. Where I'm like, God, can, can you imagine someone who thinks Brotherhood's great, but like doesn't think Revelations is? Fuck, dude. <laughs> I don't know. I think there probably is a lot of that, too, because 
as we saw on the ranking episode, a lot of people putting Brotherhood in their top three. Not as many people putting Revelations in their top three. And I that doesn't really make much sense to me other than if you're just really horny for the classic Ezio Italy atmosphere, which I get. I get it. But Revelations, it's got the polish. It's got its own identity. It's got its own tone. And it's got an, a version of Ezio with more character depth than in either of the other games. And it's got a hook blade. I'm a big fan of the hook blade. <laughs> we named our show after the hook blade. Thank fucking Christ that it didn't stay a mobile game. Or else my favorite AC would be AC2. I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, it's super interesting to imagine what Assassin's Creed Lost Legacy would have turned out to be. I suspect, though, that, yeah, it would have been a whole... It would have been its own thing, man. It would have been a whole different thing. I think that... Other than the idea of an older Ezio reconnecting with the uh, memories of Altair, to my knowledge, as far as what Darby has said in interviews, that's the only element that carried over. So the Lost Legacy on 3DS might not have even been set in Constantinople, for instance. It could have been a whole different thing. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad we got what we got, though. Well, as always, there are plenty of ways to not support the show. <laughs> leave us a leave us a like. Leave us a comment. Leave us a you guys subscribe. Should, you guys should tweet at us. Um, make sure, like once you comment on YouTube and once you make a comment on Spotify, you should tweet us and tell us what you think. I I would like to challenge our viewers to make a post on Facebook <laughs> uh, about the Hookblade podcast but only wrong descriptions of what the hook blade podcast is. Like I want, I want to see someone like telling their friends that this is the most like life affirming chicken soup for the soul type shit they've ever listened to. Right. Or like, it's like a blacksmithing episode, like a podcast or just, you know, it's about golf, whatever you want to say. And then we can just enjoy some like really confused comments at least, you know, just something to brighten the day in these dark, dark times. It's really fun to talk about things that don't suck on this podcast, which I feel like doesn't happen often enough. This hour and 27 oh, minutes of recording Lawson. has flown right by. Shit. You you have to. OK, I, I'm curious and you have to add this into the podcast. Yeah. Did you get the like secret cutscene? Did you just say secret cutscene? Like the secret Sophia cutscene? I hundred percent of the game. What? what so was you I don't. Supposed see, to do so to get the so okay. Cuts? This is what I was hoping for. I wasn't sure if you were aware of this. Would I know if I had gotten it? Well, yeah. Like, well, did you know that there's a secret Sophia cutscene that you can get? And I could tell you how you get it if you didn't know how to get it. No, I don't know. What? what, what okay. What do you have to do? So basically, <laughs> uh, and I found this out as a wee lad when I first played because I was just doing everything. I was I was completing it completely. If you buy every single book from a bookstore, I was gonna do that. You get a Sophia cutscene, kind of like finding the flowers in Syndicate. What happens if you what What happens in the Sophia cutscene? So you get all the books, and you and then you get a little Sophia memory uh, icon, and you go to the HQ, and you're walking in, and Sophia's like, "Hey, Ezio, is this is, is this where you work?" And he's like, "Prego," and she's like. I was in the neighborhood, you sly dog, and and then and you're like, well, here I want to show you something. I have I have acquired a great many books. Exactly, and all the assassins were like, you're like, who the fuck is this lady? And Ezio's like, guys, it's cool. So I'm gonna have to look that up because uh, my UPlay Plus expired, so I can't play Revelations anymore. Oh fuck! God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> you know what this has been great <laughs> i've been the hook this time and around i've been the blade and this my friends has been the hook blade has two parts the hook and the blade so you can use one or the other in elegant design <laughs> <laughs> podcast <laughs> See you next week. See you next week.
hook and the blade. So you can use one or the other. An elegant design. Elegant design. design.